Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Text for today is our gospel lesson from uh, chapter 21, particularly these words. Jesus said, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. So we are uh, continuing our sermon series that is called What Did Jesus Do? And uh, in this, we've been. Um, sort of unpacking and and wrestling with uh, an important part of the gospel story that sometimes we uh, either um, kind of forget or or, or, uh, gloss over, at least it's not forefront in our mind. Uh, As we lead into this week, uh, particularly heading towards Good Friday, one of the things we certainly focus upon is the fact that Jesus has come to die on the cross and to take away our sins. But sometimes what we forget is that Jesus actually was sent into this world to, to reverse all the effects of sin in this world. And so we've kind of been looking at all these various um, uh, events throughout his life, whether it's facing temptation, whether it's he taking care of hunger or blindness or, or whatever it might be. And so each week we've been looking at a different thing that, that Jesus did. Uh, last week we looked at, at, at Jesus as he faced violence and rejected that as a way of, of people. Uh, and today we have the strangest of them all. How many of you, when you came in and said, what is pastor thinking of? He must be crazy. How could Jesus be against religion? Anybody? You can, you can admit if you think I'm crazy. You're not the only one. Okay, thank you. One honest person. All right. Um, yeah, so, so today we're, ta- we're talk, tackling this idea and concept of, of Jesus versus religion. And uh, I realized I, I, uh, I did a screenshot of the definition. I forgot to put it in the slides, so now I have to remember. But uh, when you hear the word religion, how would you define the word religion? Anybody? Structure. Okay. Anybody else? Rules. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, um, uh, I had a, an interesting uh, thing when I was a, a senior in high school. And um, if you ever heard my story and I tell you about how God tricked me into being a pastor, um, part of that story goes that my girlfriend at the time, when her parents heard that I was, I was uh, studying to be a pastor, um, she told me, she said, I didn't realize he was so religious. And uh, I, I don't know why that has always stuck in my mind, because I thought to myself, I am? I wouldn't have thought of myself as a religious person. But at least in their mind, they connected, if you're going to be a pastor, that must mean that you are religious. So the dictionary will define something like uh, religion as a, uh, it is a, an adherent to the belief in a, a superpower or some, some divine, something that you, you know, worship. And um, a big part of it, the definition, always involves the following of, of the rules. And so I'm going to say something kind of crazy to you and shocking. I'm going to suggest to you uh, that um, Jesus, one of the things he came to put an end to is religion. Um, And so we'll see at the end of this if you you agree with me or if you're you're just done. But um, we'll see how that goes. But to set the stage, I kind of want to talk about uh, what takes place in Matthew chapter 21. So we actually saw the beginning of it because it was part of the triumphal entry, right? And so we read that uh, at the back as we talk about Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. As I told the children, Jesus has a lot of of fans at the moment because he just healed Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is walking around telling people. It's got the people excited. Well, some of the people excited. Uh, if you've been joining us on Wednesday nights, you also know that this caused the, the leaders of uh, Israel to want him dead. To not only want Jesus dead, but they were trying to figure out how to kill Lazarus as well. Um, but, but Jesus entered in Jerusalem and he comes to this, this sort of uh, this fanfare. And then what's interesting is the next thing Jesus does is he cleanses the temple. And so on the Monday of Holy Week, he enters into there and he, he uh, chases out the money changers. He says, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. Uh, he curses the fig tree, which is just, I, I wish we could do, a, do that, that story justice. Jesus comes across a, a tree that doesn't have any fruit, and so he, he curses it because he, he wanted some figs, apparently. And I don't even think figs are that good. I don't even want to do it. But, but, so he curses the fig tree. Um, then we have the authority of Jesus challenged. And for us to understand the parable of the two sons, which is our gospel lesson today, we have to kind of understand the context for it. So I'm going to read... To, to, this for you real quickly. The authority uh, of Jesus challenged. Um, and when he entered, this is Jesus, the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him saying, uh, by what authority are you doing these things? And so the reason I showed you all the other stuff was because to answer the question of what are these things? Well, these things are clearing the temple, uh, you know, this, this confrontation that he's having with 
uh, the religious leaders. And they say, what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? And then Jesus, uh, in his very Jesus way, doesn't answer their question. He does what all of our teachers told us not to do, which is answer a question with a question. But when you're Jesus, you can do that. Um, Jesus answered them, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Right? So he says, you ask me one, I'm going to ask you one. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or man? So he says, I'll, I'll answer your question. But first you tell me, this John the Baptist who was so, so famous just not too long ago, as he, when he was baptizing people, was that, was that a God thing or was that a made-up thing? Right? And um, you can think about how you might answer that yourself, but the, we're told here in Matthew, we're, we say, they discussed it among themselves, and they said to one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowds, for they hold that John was a prophet. So they say to Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus says, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, that, that might seem like kind of a strange <laughs> interaction, but it kind of sets up this, the point that Jesus is going to make with this parable, and that is this, that, that if you can't, if you didn't have discernment to know what John was doing, are you going to have discernment to know what Jesus is doing? So in other words, if, if they didn't know what was going on with the prelude to the thing, they're not going to know what's going on with the real thing when they see it. And so it's into this context where the, the religious leaders recognize that, that, that not just Jesus, but John the Baptist have both had these, these followings. The crowds have been in a fervor, and they have rejected. They have denied that Jesus was the real thing. And it's into that context. So right after they've been asked this question, and Jesus says, well, then I'm not going to answer you. He tells a parable. I think that, don't you think that's kind of interesting? Hey, we have a question. He says, no, I'm not going to tell you. But listen to this story. Right? So which, which hints to us that the answer is what? In the story. So it starts this way. The parable of two sons. What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. Um, now, I, the, the use of the language here, is, he talks to the first son. We don't know for sure that it's the firstborn son, but it probably was, because firstborns are always the best anyway. You might as well go um, see them, right? But, but he goes to the first son, and he says, hey, I want you to go and work in the vineyard today. And so the story start, starts off very simple, right? We can all, like, anybody have a kid? Have you ever asked him to do something, right? Go clean your room today. Go wash the car. Go mow the lawn, right? And... Um, and the, the next part is fun. And the answer is, the son said, I will not. Now, this is probably means actually it was the second son, right? The younger one, because the older would never do that, right? Uh, no, he says, I will not. Now, and then it's at this part of the story that every uh, Jewish person who's listened to it thinks to themselves, um, what, right? I mean, you may not be familiar, but the, the, technically in the book of Leviticus, you know what the punishment is for disobeying your parents? You could be stoned. Not, and not the good way, right? Like <laughs> thrown rocks at, right? That can actually happen. So, so everyone who's hearing the story would have been like, whoa, wait, what? The son said, no. W what are you talking about, right? So the son says, I will not. But then here's the interesting part. But afterwards, he changed his mind and he went. So the son says, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. But but then he, he repented of that and he went and did. Then he, we're told that the, the father went to the other son and he said the same. And that second son said, I'll go, sir. But he did not go, right? So you have the second one who says, yes, I'll, I'll do what I'm supposed to. But then they stayed on their phone, right? And they didn't actually go, go and do it. And so, and this is such a simple parable, but, but I want to show you kind of some cool things that are going on. So he says, which of the two did the will of the father? Wow, this is a tough question. Man, I don't, I mean, this is, why are we even talking about this story, right? It's so simple. I mean, duh, which did the will of the Father? They said, well, the first one, right? The one who didn't say the right thing, but did the right thing. So stop it and, and just think about that for a second. So now, after they questioned Jesus' authority, and he wouldn't answer the question, and he tells us a story that basically says the good guy of the story who said, is the one who might not say the right thing, but does the right thing. So in the parable, who are the Pharisees and the leaders? The second one, because they 
say the right thing, but they don't do the right thing. And so Jesus says to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Now there's two amazing things to me about, about just that, that line from Jesus. One is the people who are going into heaven are tax collectors and prostitutes. Now, we don't, we don't have the same kind of sort of, uh, there's not the same sort of stigma around, um, I mean, nobody likes the IRS, but we don't think of them as like, you know, uh, traitors to our country. Well, maybe we do. I, um, but but for, for the Jewish people, like a tax collector, if you collected taxes on your own people, you were literally thought of as a traitor, right? I mean, the, the New Testament has categories for people who are really bad, and the tax collectors get their own. That's how bad they thought of them, right? And so Jesus says, the tax collectors, to which all the people would have been like, oh, and the prostitutes. So now we've got the traitors and we have the people who, and I think by prostitutes, he wants us to think of anybody who you think is just vile, right? They're just, they're, they're so far from God, right? The traitors and the people that are far from God go into the kingdom of heaven. So this is the, the first thing that's amazing. He says, they're going into the kingdom of heaven, to which the people who are listening would have said, what? Well, how? They can't go into the kingdom of heaven. They're not, they're not like us. They don't keep the rules. They don't operate the way that, that, that we do. But Jesus says, yeah, they're going into the kingdom of heaven. And this is the part that I, I still, to be honest, I don't, I, I'm about to deliver a sermon, and I still don't totally, not sure I know what it means. They go into the kingdom of God before you. Now this, to me, is what's fascinating. Jesus does not say, of the religious leaders, that they are not going, that they are not part of the kingdom. But he is saying they are the last to get it. And, and I think that this is a, a kind of an important thing for us to, to wrestle with and, and think about, right? It, it is that Jesus is saying that he's not saying the religious leaders who have misunderstood who he is and what God uh, is doing and their relationship, they're so about the Ten Commandments and all the rules. He's not saying they're not a believer. They're not, they're not going to heaven. He doesn't say that's not the place. But he does say you're not, you're not leading the way, Right? In fact, he unpacks it this way. He says, for John came, and John means who? The Baptist. Yep, John the Baptist came to you in the way of righteousness. You did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds. And so if we connect this to the parable, he's saying the tax collectors and sinners are the first son who did not say the right thing, but they did the right. What's the thing they did? Believe. Repent and believe. Yeah. They repented. They turned away from what they were doing. And they turned towards Jesus. Were they now sinless? Were they now perfect? But they turned away from what they were doing and they turned toward Jesus. And so if the, if the Pharisees and the religious leaders are the second son, what did they not do? They didn't repent, and they didn't turn towards Jesus. And, and so what, what is so powerful, I think, about this is what Jesus is saying is that they have entirely misunderstood, that their, their devotion to God, their literal way that they were trying to appease and be uh, accepted in God's eyes was wrong. It was impossible to do what they were trying to do. They were, not, they were trying to establish a relationship or, or continue a relationship with God based on what they did. Do you know what we call that? We call that a religion. What we do to honor, appease, obey a higher power or something else. Something else in this world, right? We can, have, we can have other things to which we are beholden in this world as well, right? We chase after money or fame or, or, or whatever it might be, power. We think these are the things that will make us happy. When we approach anything this way, something else in this world that we think is going to complete us because we have done X, Y, and Z, that's a religion. And Jesus says, that doesn't work. So, uh, to continue with what we began, I would suggest to you, that there is no such thing as Christianity. 
Uh, we did this series in the fall, and so you heard me tell you that you're all unchristian, right? You remember that? Um, because we, are, we do not adhere to, we are not obedient to something. We follow someone. We follow a person. We follow a person who walked on this earth, a person who died in our place, and a person who rose again. I don't know if you've um, ever stopped and thought about it, but, but this is actually how God always talked. So it's not like he, he changed what he was saying to his people. It's that they misunderstood it. They, surprise, surprise, humans wanted to operate based on their agenda, not on God's. But, but you can go, we could go all over the place. But just one place, for example, in the book of Isaiah chapter 9, God said to his people, this is after they have been put, put in captivity because of their disobedience. He said, the people draw near me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They say the right thing, but they don't, don't do it. And, and, and don't misunderstand, I'm not saying or suggesting to you that this means, hey, when people do the right thing, that's why God accepts them. That's, that's not the case. In fact, it's, it's the exact opposite. Later on, Paul would say in Galatians, he'd put it this way. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. I think this is so fascinating. He's using a, a legal term that would have existed in, in the, the Roman world, right? So if you were the, if, if you were the, um, the oldest son, in most cases, where you were going to inherit the estate, you were going to take over your father's uh, property and estate and all that kind of stuff, you had a tutor, you had a guardian who, who taught you and how to do it all and, and, and raised you up, right? And then when you became of age... You were the one who took over running everything, right? But until you were ready to do that, you had a guardian. And, and so Paul paints this picture and he says, in the old days, right, before Jesus has come, we had the law that acted as a, as a guardian for us. But now that Jesus has come, we are justified by faith. So in other words, once, we are, once Jesus had come, we now follow Jesus, we don't, we don't follow the guardian. We don't, we don't operate by what, what the guardian it says. But now the faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Right? Now, think about what this means. Like, if we, if we take this analogy and run with it. What it means is, when we operate, when we still try to operate with God by our, the things we do, by our agenda, we are saying we want to be under a guardian again. We're telling God, we don't like that freedom you gave us. We want to be back under the guardian. Paul will later on, after he's unpacked it in Galatians 5, say this, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. When Jesus stepped into this world and, and he sought to defeat all the things that, that are a barrier between us and God, one of the biggest for him to defeat was religion was the idea that we can create the relationship with God based on the things that we do, the way that we act. And when Jesus steps into this world, he says, no, that's not, that's not what it's about. We don't follow rules. We don't follow... Some of you are going to be kind of mad. We don't follow a book. We follow a person. And his name... Is Jesus. And so Jesus steps into this world, and that's why he can say in the parable that, that the, the, the tax collectors and sinners, they may have not said the right thing, but they did the will of the Father. Which is not, not to give up their sinful lifestyle, which eventually they would, but their relationship was because they repented, they turned away from their old way, and they turned to a person. Turn to Jesus Christ. If you have lived today or yesterday or, or any time in the past with any shred of, of doubt about how God feels about you, if you've ever 
uh, tried to approach him and, and, and thought, you know, if, if, if he'll answer my prayer if I, if I do this, if I, if, I, if I tithe some money or if I help the old lady across the street or if I hand some money to that guy who's begging at the, at the corner, right? If, you, if you've ever thought, well, you know, if I, if I do the right thing, then, then God is going to act this way, I have to tell you that's not how it works. But I also have to tell you that you have a God who already loves you. That you have a God who first loved you. And that he desires a relationship with you so much that he would send his own son to die in your place. Jesus came to put an end to religion so that we might follow a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen.